difference. What does that mean? It means if I put force in that material, the viscosity goes down. Okay, it's very important for solder paste. Uh, it's a critical parameter uh, that we use to our advantage when we're printing solder. So if we look at something called hysteresis or that ability for that material to come back. So if you apply force onto the material, the viscosity drops. You then relax that force and the viscosity climbs back up. And the level at which it comes back up is called the hysteresis curve or the how, f how far back does it come. So if you look Oops, there should have been. Oh, this will show you. Um, so here we're increasing the shear rate. It comes down. As we release that shear, it comes back up. But notice it doesn't come back up to the same exact point. Okay? Um, depending on the amount of force you put in and things like that, it's not exactly um, one to one. There is what we call a hysteresis curve to it. And so that's why we look at stencil life for a paste. Right? So if you're printing the paste and it always came exactly back, it wouldn't matter about how long it was on that stencil getting beat up. But some paste, this recovery rate may be much lower. So every time you're beating it up, it comes back here, and then it comes back here, and then it comes back here, and then it comes back down to here, and then you start seeing slump, bridging, things like that. So the, in understanding this, this curve, and as formulators, we try to understand that to say, OK, we want this to be as close to coming back up to here as possible, OK? But the laws of physics and chemistry and stuff get in the way, making it absolutely perfect. That's why we look at things like stencil life, work life on a paste. So one of the things that we look at, it's also related to the tack time, okay? Because if that material doesn't recover, then you're not gonna have a lot of tack force. And so on your pick and place machine, as you're going through the pick and place machine, the parts are gonna start running around and touching one another and give you a single IO board, which typically customers don't like because then all the parts are bridged. Um, so we wanna stay away from that. So, so rheology, Viscosity um, are important factors, and it's not just a lot of times a day sheet will say you may see a, um, you know, two different viscosity numbers at two different shear rates, and that's why. You want to know well, how much, what's the viscosity with no shear, and what's the viscosity when there is shear force applied? Because we're going to do that. As I walk through the printer, I'll show you where that shear force is applied and how it actually affects the performance of the material. So if you look at, at printing, um, what are we trying to do? So we're trying to put controlled, consistent volume of paste in a, in a desired place on the circuit board. That's why those pads are there. That's where you want the paste. You don't want it on the solder mask. You don't want it, you know, on a test point. You don't want it, or maybe you do. Um, but you don't want it where, where, you know, in some other location. And you want it to be the same every time. I think you guys heard this morning about inspection, right? One of the things about inspection of, of paste is to say, how close is it to the, our golden board, or how, or how consistent is that deposit and that volume of material? Okay, you want that volume to be consistent because you want to be able to solder those joints together. We don't have enough material to form that solder joint, not too much so that you get slumping or bridging or other, other issues. And you want it right where you're going to put the component. Okay? So if you look at the print process here, speed and pressure will affect the amount of shear force on that amount of paste. And we just talked about shear force and viscosity and rheology a little bit. Okay, so that speed and pressure factor into that. So how fast you're running that squeegee, how much pressure there is, will apply a force to this paste and cause it to roll. Okay, and as that paste is rolling, it's shear thinning, so it's lower viscosity, and it fills up all these little holes you have on your stencil, okay? And if, you know, if you've ever tried to, to caulk something in a little narrow hole, the thicker the material, the harder it is to fill inside of a little gap, okay? So we don't want a thick material at that point. So the speed and the pressure apply that shear force, causes the paste to roll. And that rolling action actually helps to fill the apertures. So a couple things you want to look for on a printer is you want to make sure that paste is rolling, that it actually moves and rolls kind of like a log across the, the stencil. And it's hard to see shear thinning, but you'll know if you don't get it, because typically those apertures won't be filled very well. And I'll show you some of that later. <laughs> um, so the circular motion, that's what we talked about roll. The other thing I'll talk about a little bit later is, is you'll see here where the board is flat up against the bottom of the stencil, the gasketing. Okay, we're putting pressure on the solder paste. So if you put pressure and there's a little gap here between the board and the stencil, that paste is going to squeeze out into that little gap. Okay, 
which tends to cause you problems like solder balling, um, could be bridging, uh, could be flux bleed, there could be all kinds of stuff that happens because that board's not sitting tight up against the bottom of the stencil. You have a little gap and because we're putting pressure onto the solder paste, it's shear thinning and so it'll flow into that little gap and, and it'll, then it'll be where you don't want it and then you'll see that effect as well. Next thing we look at is drop off and separation speed. So when you separate, the reason why we have this stencil, why there's holes, those holes correspond to the deposit that we want on the circuit board. Okay, so the speed comes across, it drops, and then you pull down your board, and you have a nice, happy little brick of paste. Okay, that should be uh, exactly or very close to the image of what that hole is. Okay, so separation speed comes into play there. It's another way that we put shear force on that paste to get it to release. Okay, so if you quickly pull that board down, you get actually a little bit of a shear effect on the edges, it helps it to release a little bit better. Uh, so that's something you can um, control in your process to give you a uh, good release. We also want this paste to drop off the, the squeegee blade, because usually you're gonna have another blade that's gonna come down and you wanna print in the other direction. Okay, so if that paste is all gummed up and sticky on here, that's not good. So the paste has gotta have that rheology and viscosity in a way that'll actually fall and drop off that squeegee, uh, allowing it to be a nice brick here so you can print in the other direction. Okay, so sometimes you get curtaining, uh, but really what you want is this sort of, sometimes you'll get a little bit of this and then as the next blade comes down it starts, it'll, it'll break off. Um, sometimes you get like a little curtain for like a second or so and then it falls down, that's fine. The idea is that when you start the next end of the process, that you start with a bead of solder to come across. And why our solder is red? Because this is gray and a gray blob on a gray square doesn't make it. If your solder is red, there's probably something else going on you need to talk to. Although we do print adhesives too, but I'm not gonna get into that. That's a whole nother fun game. Um, so what are the, some of the key variables uh, in printing? Uh, your paste, your stencil design, uh, the board design, the squeegee, the printer set up, and, and the conditions. So I'm not gonna talk about all these. I think you're hearing from some other speakers today on some of those other aspects. So I'm gonna cover some of them uh, a little bit more detail uh, with the time I have. And then I think some of these I think will be covered in other parts of the discussion today. So what is solder paste? Um, solder paste is basically a bunch of little metal spheres inside of a flux medium. It's usually about 90% um, uh, by weight. If you do by volume, it's about 50-50. Um, so by volume, it's 50-50, that means a 10 mil thick deposit, which probably many of you are not printing 10 mils anymore, but the math is easy. Half of that is a 5 mil, or if you're printing 5 mils, you're left with 2.5. I can do that math too. Um, but if you look at it, here's a cartoon. Basically, if you talk about, and we'll talk about particle size as well. So for type 3 powder that's tin, silver, copper, every one of these little spheres is in that particle size range, and every sphere is tin, silver, and copper. Okay, so when you get an alloy of a paste, it's not each sphere is a different alloy, right? You've got some, te some tin and some lead spheres. No, we've got tin lead spheres or we've got sack spheres. And they're inside this medium. Now this medium, I talked about formulating about rheology and viscosity. There's stuff that we add to that medium. There's chemicals and things that we add that give it those properties, that give it what we call a gel structure or thixotropic agents. Okay, so there's things we put in medium that give it those properties, as well as all the stuff to remove oxides when you do soldering, uh, as well as resist moisture uptake, because it would naturally do that, so we gotta do that as well. Oh, and by the way, it's gotta be no clean, right? So you don't wanna clean it when you're done. So all the activators that do all the work to clean off all the oxides, you want them, after they do that, to not do that anymore. So then they gotta stop, so you gotta put in a mechanism to turn them off, or to capture them later on. So there's a lot of stuff in this yellow blob here do a lot of different things. And none of them can interact in a way that's gonna cause problems. Because um, we've made those formulations that mix it all up, it looks good. On the first print and the second print, you got a brick. So, not so good. So all those little ingredients go in and the magic foo-foo dust and whatever to get us a wonderful solder paste. So, and actually we'll have a, if those who are interested, we'll be having a discussion on solder particle sizes in J Standard 5 tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., <laughs> which will be on the topic. Um, but most of you are probably familiar with type 3 and it's probably so prevalent it probably just you think that's what solder paste is. Type 3 is the mo by far the most common paste. 
Um, if you look at the particle sizes, most of us talk about microns. Most of them are between 25 and 45 microns. Um, and this is the mesh sizes. So um, if you think about sieves or meshes, um, those are, are the mesh sizes that we use. Uh, talk about in mils, between 1 and 1.8. Um, and this is, you know, 90 plus percent of the particles are in that range, okay? We're seeing more and more today people looking at type 4 powder, so it's a little bit smaller uh, because you get the finer pitch, and I'll show you when we talk about, a little bit about aperture filling. If you think about it, you get a bunch of these spheres in this paste. Those spheres have to fit through those little holes in the apertures. Well, the bigger the spheres, the bigger that aperture has to be to, for them all to fill in there and release really well. And so if the apertures get smaller, then you want your particle sizes to get smaller, okay? Which is why we go tar start talking about type four. And then type five and six um, are typically used in the semiconductor arena where uh, they are used on wafer printing to make the bumps. So sometimes people drop spheres to make the bumps on packages, so like a CSP or a BGA. Um, some people actually print uh, little, very small amounts of solder uh, and once solder mets, wets and melts, it actually forms a sphere. That's how we create the spheres to begin with. You take molten solder and you drop them through a column of, of whatever proprietary design you have, but liquids naturally form a sphere in a vacuum without any, or, or just in air, without any um, other effect on them. And so that's how you get the spheres on the bottom of CSPs or BGAs. But when we're talking about particle sizes here, I don't think many folks are even using type 1 or type 2, the few applications I've seen that still may use type 2. Most folks are in the type 3 range. Some of you may be using type 4 or considering type 4. Um, Mother Nature doesn't give you anything for free. So you want to go, I mean, a lot of people say, well, type 4 must be easier to print. I want to do type 4. Why not? What, what harm can there be? Um, you know, it's harder for us to make type 4, so therefore we pass it along to you as a higher price, typically. Um, and so they're harder to make, it's harder to, to